Today is the second Sunday of Advent, and we light the candle of peace. Last Sunday, we, hit, we lit the first candle in our Advent wreath and celebrated the faith of the people in the Old Testament who looked forward to God's blessing, hope in Christ. We light it again as we remember our Savior, born a king in the line of the King of King David. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and we believe that he will come again to fulfill all of God's promises to us, to rule the world wisely and bless all nations. Today we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace. We remember the prophets who spoke of the coming of Christ, of how a Savior would be born, a king in the line of King David. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 9, verse 2, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And continuing on in verse 6, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When Jesus came, he taught people the importance of being peacemakers. He said that those who make peace shall be called the children of God. When Christ comes to us, he brings us peace, and he will bring everlasting peace when he comes again. We light the candle of peace to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and that through him, peace is found. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the peace we find in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, light of the world, the prophet said you would bring peace and save your people from trouble. Give peace in our hearts this year. We ask that as we wait for you to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your peace with each other. We ask it in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. When you think of that wonderful, beautiful night 2,000 years ago, what do you picture? What imagery goes through your mind when you think of that immaculate night in Bethlehem when heaven reached down to kiss the earth? I think that for many of us, it usually goes something like this. Joseph and Mary, maybe cuddled together in the warm stable, watching in wonder as their newborn baby a child sleeps peacefully in the manger bed. A cow and a donkey might be looking on too, softly lowing or gently nodding as they too seem to understand that on this night, in their very presence, something wonderful has happened. Outside, all is calm and all is bright as the snow gently falls to the ground. Over on the hillside, shepherds are tending their flocks when an angel choir appears to them, singing to them beautifully the glad tidings of great joy. Rejoicing, they almost dance into the town to meet the baby who was born king of the Jews. And when the shepherds finally grow weary of rejoicing and head on home, then the mortals sleep as the angels keep their silent watch above. Meanwhile, in a far-off land, the three kings of the Orient spot a brand new star in the skies to the west, and as they discuss what it might mean, one of them recalls an ancient prophecy. And so they gather their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, load up their camels, and begin their journey to welcome the king. Soon after, they arrive in Bethlehem, and they find the beautiful star of Bethlehem shining over the stable, and, and re they reverently step inside to greet the baby Jesus, the baby who was born to save the world from their sins, born to bring peace to us all. It all sounds so wonderful, doesn't it? Like the Christmas stories of old, it nearly makes me want to take a step back and then jump right into that moment, to be a part of that most wonderful night on earth. Except there is one problem that this isn't really the way that most of it happened. In all honesty, there probably wasn't very much peace in this story at all. So maybe we should start over, slow down, and take another look at what may have happened on that beautiful, wonderful night. To really get a better picture, 
we need to back up a bit. We need to zoom out. See, when we join the story, Israel, it's no longer a free nation. They'd started as God's chosen people, and they still were, but they had turned their backs on him again and again. And as he often did throughout their history, God tried to get their attention, sometimes through prophets, sometimes by allowing them to be taken captive by an outside power. And this time it was Rome, that mighty power from the West who only about 60 years before, under the command of Pompey the Great, had captured Jerusalem, and with it, the nation of Judah. Only a few years later, Rome installed a puppet king over Judea, Herod, the former governor of Galilee and a personal friend, both Mark Antony and Octavian. Under the rule of King Herod, Jerusalem itself drew a lot of attention. Herod focused on turning it into this Hellenistic metropolis, upgrading the infrastructure, pouring money and resources, and massive amounts of time into rebuilding the temple, something which was central to the Israelite life. But for the rest of the Jews, the middle, the lower class Jews, life was still hard. The Jews, for one, practiced a very different religion from their neighbors. Uh, and this made them pretty unpopular. So they often banded together. They stayed in close-knit communities, and they lived life on the defensive. For the most part, they could live their day-to-day -day lives unmolested, but there were constant reminders that they weren't a free people. Their synagogues, for instance, the lifeblood of their communities, had to be technically classified as colleges so they could get around the Roman laws against secret societies. And the taxes that they paid not only supported their own communities and their nation, but more importantly, they had to pay extra to support the empire itself. These were hard times for hard-working, freedom-minded people, people who knew they were chosen by God. And the province of Judea was often the sparking point for rebellions. But it wasn't just the political atmosphere that made life less than peaceful. Joseph and Mary's own relationship had been hit with a real curveball when shortly after they became engaged to be married, the angel of the Lord came to visit her. The angel of the Lord. Uh, this, this probably wasn't quite like we would typically imagine it. I mean, for a start, it should make you raise an eyebrow. When almost every time that an angel shows up in Scripture, they have to lead with the line, do not be afraid. I mean, can you imagine? They're still maybe excited and, and dreaming about her engagement, uh, which in the ancient Jewish culture was actually phase one of being married, just without the living together part. Uh, and Mary's in her room when all of a sudden it fills with light and this huge, strange, heavenly being is standing or, or even floating right there in front of her. And his words, as incredible and extraordinary as they were, in a practical sense, did nothing at all to bring peace into their lives. Uh, he said, you will conceive and give birth to a son and his name shall be called Jesus. Now this was the exact news that the world had been waiting for since its fall. The exact news that every Jewish mother had hoped and prayed could be delivered to her one day. But not like this. Not while she was still betrothed. See, these words also meant that Joseph, and especially Mary, would carry the stigma about her. Because everybody could see that she was pregnant well before her wedding feast. But who could ever believe that this child was from God? In fact, as they talked together after the angel visit, they realized they had some extremely difficult decisions to make. And Joseph, though it sounds harsh to us now, he did the most loving thing that he could. He offered to divorce her privately. See, engagements in those days could only be ended through divorce or death. And to the eyes of the world, it would seem that Mary had been unfaithful to Joseph in their year of betrothal, and, and this would have serious implications on her. And as a result, Joseph would be expected, as a good Jew, to divorce her. But there were a few different ways to go about doing this. Number one, if the woman had been unfaithful, the man could get a public divorce in the presence of the elders, and he would be entitled to a full refund of the bride price, which he had paid. So had he gone this route, which he probably would have done if not for a deep and true love for Mary, he probably would have benefited uh, financially in a pretty substantial way. But that's not the option that he chose. The second option was for the man to divorce his fiancée wife privately. 
In this scenario, he would simply hand her a certificate of divorce, and as a result, he would forfeit his right to the refunded bride price, thereby almost taking the blame on himself. This also ensured that the woman would be able to marry somebody else, likely maybe the other person, in the presence of two or three witnesses. It was still shameful, but for the woman it was the far better option. And so with this heartbreaking, this was exactly what Joseph offered to do, what he was going to do until he received an angelic visitor himself. And the angel said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take this woman home. In other words, don't be afraid to continue your engagement and one day take Mary home as your lawful and much beloved wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Wow, so much for a young couple to process and to deal with, and yet they did. I mean, isn't that the beauty of it? Isn't that a miracle? Because God was leading their way. Joseph and Mary found the courage to go forward and move ahead with his plan. And that was exactly the kind of parents that God knew that Jesus needed. Parents of faith who weren't afraid to do the hard things if they knew that God was in charge. What an example they would one day be for the boy Jesus. They were parents he could look up to and parents he could learn from. And so time went on and Mary began to grow and grow. And she spent about three months visiting her cousin Elizabeth, who also was pregnant. Now, I imagine she did this in part to get, you know, out of the local public eye. But Mary and Elizabeth spent some serious time encouraging each other lifting one another up in prayer and sharing this special time for the both of them. You know, both pregnancies were quite remarkable. Elizabeth was old and barren, and Mary was a virgin. But together, they lifted each other up, and they pointed each other towards God and his love for them. Now, my wife Megan and I recently welcomed our second baby into our family, and as somebody who has never been pregnant myself, I don't think I could ever possibly fully appreciate all that she went through. But even from a distance, I, I couldn't help but notice something. Uh, it might just be me, but she seemed uncomfortable. And, and this year, as I think about that journey to Bethlehem, my heart can't help but to go out to young Mary, who had really no choice in the matter. See, in those days, Caesar Augustus uh, had issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and every person had to go to their own town to register. This wasn't uncommon. It happened every 14 years or so. But what was uncommon, at least for Joseph and Mary, was that this time Mary was very, very pregnant. Now, I couldn't even begin to imagine how she must have felt nine months pregnant, traveling those 144 forced kilometers from Nazareth to Bethlehem. You know, whether she was on foot or had the privilege of riding on a donkey or in a cart, we don't know, but the four or five days it likely took them were probably some of the most unbearable moments of her life. But she bravely endured. I'm sure that she shed more than a few tears. I'm sure that Joseph did his best to be her support, but there was really only so much that he could do. They really had no other choice. But like before, Mary and Joseph, they made a conscious decision to trust fully in God, both to guide them as well as to take care of them every step along the way. Now, finally, after what must have seemed forever, they reached the little town of Bethlehem and what joy must have filled their hearts as they began to draw near. See, this first leg of their journey was almost complete and rest was in sight. Except, as we already know, there was no room for them in the inns. I can't begin to imagine how Joseph and then Mary must have felt as time and time again they knocked, only to be turned away from each door. And then, at last, a stable was offered. Their hearts must have simultaneously jumped and broken. I mean, for here was to be born Jesus the king of the Jews, their son entrusted to them by God himself. You know, I can't help but wonder if they must have felt like they had already failed him. Surely, 
this couldn't be the way that God planned to bring his only son into the earth, but this was what they had, and this was all they could do, and so this was exactly what they did. And that night, making the most that they possibly could with a bed of straw, an empty manger, and some burial clothes, Mary and Joseph welcomed baby Jesus into the world. Now, I don't need to point out that the birth process itself is hardly peaceful, but when they are done and they could begin to breathe once again, in their arms lay Jesus, a baby born to save the world from its sins, a baby born to bring peace to us all. See, all of this is to say that there was nothing even remotely peaceful about the world that Jesus was born into, but that didn't matter. That wasn't the point. Jesus was the one who brought peace into the midst of a world gone mad. And that is what's important. See, Jesus wasn't born into a peaceful world. He didn't grow up in a peaceful world. He didn't even leave a peaceful world behind him. And yet, Jesus one day would talk with his disciples and he would confidently say to them, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. As it turned out, in the days after he said this, Jesus' disciples would encounter the exact opposite of peace as he was arrested and tried and beaten and taken to the cross. And yet, on the other hand, in the midst of all this chaos, there was peace after all, because far from leaving them alone in an unpeaceful world, Jesus left them something, something wonderful and something world-changing. Jesus left them, God in us, the Holy Spirit. See, with Jesus come to us and the Holy Spirit in us, we can have a confidence that even in our darkest hours, we'll never face life alone. God cares. God loves you. He sees what you face. He sees your broken heart and your broken dreams. He sees your longings and your loneliness, your triumphs and, and, and he rejoices with you. Your life matters to God. And we can see this in the person of Jesus, not only coming to die for our sins, but also coming to live with us, to walk and to be among us. We see this in the Holy Spirit as well, living in us and empowering us to do God's will. And so long as he's welcome, he's here facing each moment that we face from within us. And we can find our courage in that. We can find our peace on earth in that. All of this begins to take even greater importance and meaning for us now, in 2020. What a year it has been. A once in a hundred years pandemic, uh, climate emergencies declared, can you remember that? Uh, Non-stop politicking and elections where, where neighbors and family members can't even talk together civilly if they have different points of view. We've lost many beloved people. We've lost businesses and jobs, and, and we're alone like never before. <laughs> There's even the possibility of murder hornets. Uh, once again, we find ourselves living in a not-so-peaceful world. And yet, just like before, Jesus is working tirelessly to bring peace into our lives. Romans 8, 20, 834 tells us that Christ Jesus who died and more than that, who is brought back to life is even now at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And did you catch that? Jesus, he's in our corner, even as we speak. And as it says just a few short verses before that, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has justified? No one. Who, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Though the storm may blow around us, and believe me, it will, Jesus has come into the world, into our world, to bring us peace. May each of us grab onto that peace, and may we let it guide us through. May it give us courage to face each new day as walking with Jesus. We face every new challenge and difficulty with confidence, sure of who's leading us, sure that he who goes before will see it on to completion. Fear not, the angel said. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe 
wrapped in swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger. For the past 14 years, Chetwin, BC has been giving artists a chance to carve their dreams. Artists come from all over the world in June and leave us with stunning sculptures. Wood plays a vital role in this town. It's ingrained everywhere you look. I like the hippo, and uh, even though my buddy here uh, carved the moose last year, I bought off of him. I still have to go with the hippo this year. What do you like about it? I just like it's different. It's completely different from what we've seen up here. We don't see a lot of that uh, African type things. You know, it's all eagles, bears, and it's all that kind of stuff. So that's just unique this year. So that's why I'm voting for it this year. What are you carving? Uh, yeah, I carve a uh, hippo and a rhino. Why? Uh, my, my son, favorite animal. <laughs> it's an important, almost confession of she changed me. And so he wanted to honor her in a way by having her check and saying, wow, she's exceptional. She's not someone who just messes around in fancy outfits. She's an educated person to be respected. Well, heck, everybody wants to be in the top three, but just to be here, I'm happy. If I could pull it off and have it look somewhat like a woman, even Gaga, that would be great. As long as it doesn't look like Harmon Munster, I think I've done my job. Bought at the sheep's head races. Strong behind rye with 
sour pickle. My personal puss on a wooden nickel. Look at me.